So we're going to continue with our kinematics. And first of all, do you know the difference between distance and displacement? The idea that distance is how far you would travel. So if you throw a ball up in the air and you catch it exactly where you threw it from, it hasn't ended anywhere other than it started from. But its distance, it's traveled. It's two meters up and two meters down. So it's traveled four, but its displacement would be zero. That's why I find, as far as like doing exercising, running is very hard for me. Because you start in one spot, you run around the block, and 10 minutes later, you're back to where you started from. And it feels like, did I accomplish anything? <laughs> I could have got to where I started from a lot faster just by staying there. But I guess you exercise in the process. I don't know if it makes I don't know if it makes any more sense that I find much more enjoyment on a soccer field where there's this little ball that we run around. And at the end, was, is there really any point to that other than I thought it was fun? But yeah, so dis distance and displacement, different things. What's happening, remember we've got our, if we take the integral of velocity, we're going to get our displacement. And what's happening when we take our integral of velocity, it's equal to our displacement. But sometimes, depending on the direction you're traveling, this is what could have happened with the ball. Part of it was positive distance, and then it went to negative because it was coming back. And it ended up that those areas added up to be 0. So just like we did before, we could break it up into two parts. And whatever parts are below, we know that the integral of those parts are negative. And then you'd have to add the absolute value wherever you needed it. Okay? I guess we could put absolute values over both of these parts and then not even have to worry about which one is positive and which one is negative. But you would have to determine where those x-intercepts are so you know where your areas are positive and where your areas are negative. So if you wanted to calculate the distance, then you could do so. All right, so now these ones, we can solve them with physics. You've got physics formulas to probably do this. Now we're going to look, how would we solve this with calculus. Okay? And we've got our cliff, 75 meters tall, tall, high. Golf ball is thrown upward with a velocity of 7 meters per second from the edge of the cliff. Seven meters per second upwards. How long will it take the golf ball to hit the ground at the bottom of the cliff? What are things that we know? We know acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? That's, so that's something that is assumed that you know from this moving forward. So it's not going to be on a formula sheet. Well, we don't have a formula sheet. But you will have to know gravity is negative 9.8. Okay? What other things do we know? So at t equals 0, we know our velocity is equal to 7 meters per second. Yeah, but I'm going to just write it like this for now. Okay? What else do we know? Okay. Now, if we, if we make ground level 0, right, which is normally what people would do in a situation like this, then we also know at time equals 0 that our displacement is 75. 
it's starting 75 meters above the ground. Okay. We're trying to solve for T when the ball hits the ground. In order to do that, we would need an equation. We would need an equation that is an equation for that displacement, and we'd want to know when that displacement was at zero. Okay. Some people find it hard to visualize this as zero. Then they would make this zero here. You could do that as well. But then you need to find out when the displacement is negative 75. So either way would work. And it just depends on how you set things up. So first of all, how could we work backwards? We know this. We know this for sure. That means we can integrate our way back until we get an equation for our displacement. And once we integrate all the way back, we're going to be able to use that to figure out the question and solve for time. So integrating once for our velocity, if I integrate negative 9.8 with respect to time, I'm going to get that my velocity is negative 9.8t plus c. And since we know our initial velocity is 7, when our time is 0, we're going to determine that c has to be 7. Just plug in 0 for time and 7 for v. And then it's obvious that c is equal to 7. So then our velocity becomes negative 9.8t plus 7. From there, we integrate again to find our displacement. And integrating. with respect to t. You get 9.8 divided by 2. I just changed that to 4.9 right away. Plus 7t plus d. And again, since we know that the displacement is starting 75 meters above the ground to begin with, plugging in 0 for t will mean that d has to be 75. Can you see if you made your starting point zero, if you wanted to think about, if you wanted to go back to our cliff and I said two different ways that you could imagine this, we can imagine the ground at zero and the cliff being 75 above, then at time zero, the displacement is 75. Sometimes that rubs people the wrong way because they're saying, well, it has, if it's your starting point, it hasn't been displaced anywhere. It should technically be 0 when you start. If you were to do that, then if you started this as 0 here, can you see down below would be negative 75. Now, if you had started with 0 up here, it's pretty obvious that when you plug in 0 for t, and you know that you're starting with 0, that d would also be 0. Correct? So then your equation just wouldn't have this. Now, when we're solving the equation, no matter which form you used, okay? Now, with the equation we have here, we want to find out the time when it hits the ground. So, according to our or original diagram, that would make s equal to 0. If we'd used the other diagram, we wouldn't have this 75 here but we'd have to plug in negative 75 here. Can you see why that's exactly the same? Because all I would have to do is add that 75 to the other side, and my equation would be identical. So if you're worried about what do I have to make for this to work, whatever you logically decide, and then do the math from there, it will work out. As long as you logically decide something that makes sense. If you logically decide something that makes no sense, you might run into a few errors. So now we just need to solve for this. Um, I don't like the factoring thing that's looking here. I'd probably go to the quadratic formula or calculator. 
you have calculator with your calculator already? How handy is that? Time could equal 4.69. What's the other answer that it gives? Yeah, I want to know what that one is. Minus 3.26. So you could use your, your graphing calculator, either graph it and find the x-intercepts or use the quadratic formula to solve for this. You should get two answers. This one, of course, is going back in time, quite unlikely. Okay? 4.69 makes sense. If we think about what happens anytime you throw an object up in the air, always makes a parabola. The reason why this didn't make your two answers weren't symmetrical, where one was negative and the other one was positive in a perfect way, because it was going up to begin with, so your axis of symmetry is somewhere here. If you were allowed to go back in time, apparently that rock came down from inside the cliff, came into your hand, and then you threw it up. Oh. These qu questions would be way more fun if you were allowed to go back in time. So the only answer that makes sense is 4.69. Since we were dealing in seconds, those would be our units. 4.69.